Hello everyone, and welcome to the 147th episode of Analyzing Evil, featuring Rumi Hidaka from Perfect Blue, the film that propelled Satoshi Kon to stardom. Perfect Blue is a masterclass in psychological drama, a film that subverts your expectations and leaves you wondering what the hell you just watched, and Rumi Hidaka stands at the center of it all. In this video, we'll be running through everything we're given about Rumi and the profession that warped her into the dualistic monster she became, but Satoshi Kon is one of my favorite directors of all time, and I owe him a lot when you consider that his series Paranoia Agent introduced me to my favorite musical artist, Susumu Hirasawa, way back in 2004 and you can expect to see videos on all of his works at some point in the future. Now we all struggle with some bad habits, myself included, and sometimes it seems like it would be easier to fit a camel through the eye of a needle than it would be to phase out our bad habits. While that may be true, there are options out there, and our sponsor for this video, Fume, is one of them. Fume aims to help you curb one of the most notorious bad habits by taking the bad out of it. Instead of electronics, Fume is completely natural. Instead of vapor, Fume uses flavored air. And instead of harmful chemicals, Fume uses all natural delicious flavors. For this type of habit though, it's not just about what you're inhaling, but what to do with your hands once you've managed to kick it. Fume helps with that as well with their adjustable airflow dial and movable parts, making it great for fidgeting, which is helpful for de-stressing and anxiety when you're breaking your habit. I was surprised by just how tasty this product is. It's intense, but light and refreshing at the same time, and the weight and feel of the core is stylish and satisfying to play with. Fume has some new flavors available for you to try as well, and the variation greatly helps you in sticking with Fume rather than falling back into your old habits. Stopping is something we all put off because it's hard, but switching to Fume is easy, enjoyable, and even fun. Fume has served over 100,000 customers and has thousands of success stories, and there's no reason that can't be you. Join Fume in accelerating humanity's breakup from destructive habits by picking up the journey pack today. Head to tryfume.com slash thevioli or scan the QR code and use code thevioli to get 10% off when you get the journey pack today. That's tryfum.com and use code THEVIOLI to save an additional 10% off your order today. Thank you, Fume, for sponsoring this video. Now, without further ado, let's begin. The life of a Japanese pop idol is glamorous and rewarding, but it's also stressful, abusive, invasive, and highly volatile. The Japanese pop idol sensation was first inspired by something that most people, including myself, would have never expected, with a French film. If you want a more in-depth look into this phenomenon, there are better resources out there, but for the purposes of this video, this excerpt from Wikipedia will give us a good idea of how the idol phenomenon began. The popularity of young female singers can be traced back to Sayuri Yoshinaga in the 1960s, as well as the Takarazuka review and theater shows from the Meiji era. In 1962, Johnny Kitagawa founded Johnny and Associates and created the group Johnny's, which is retroactively considered the first idol group in Japan. He is also credited with pioneering the idol trainee system, where talents would be accepted in the agency at a young age and trained not only in singing, but also dancing and acting until they were ready for debut. However, the concept of an idol wasn't defined by mainstream Japanese media until November 1964, when the 1963 French film Cherche Lido was released in Japan under the title Aiduru Osagase. Many Japanese audiences took interest in Sylvie Vartan, whose song La Plus Belle Pour Aller Danser from the film sold more than a million copies in Japan. Vartan was heralded for her youthful adorable looks and musical talent, leading the Japanese entertainment industry to assign the word idol to singers who shared a similar aesthetic. Television greatly impacted the popularity of the idol phenomenon, as beginning in the 1970s, many idols were recruiting through audition programs. In addition, the availability of having home television sets gave audiences greater accessibility of seeing idols at any time compared to going to theaters. Momoi Yamaguchi, Junko Sakurada, Saori Minami, and Mari Amachi, some of the idols recruited through television, were some of the more popular figures of this era, along with groups such as Candies and Pink Lady. Saori Minami, who debuted in 1971, was noted by scholar Masayoshi Sakai to be the turning point of when teenage stars became popular in mainstream media. Music was produced by a shared climate of songwriters and art directors who were seeking a step towards a depoliticized youth culture. Idols grew in popularity over the 1970s, as they offered audiences escapism from political violence and radical student movements. Idols at the time were seen as ephemeral because of how short-lived their careers were and how they would disappear from the public after retirement. 
In public, idols took steps to play a distinct character and uphold an illusion of perfection, such as maintaining a virginal image. Other examples include being told not to use restrooms in public and answering interview questions about their favorite food, with feminine-sounding answers such as strawberries and shortcake. Now even from this small excerpt, we're given a good idea of how the idol craze began and just how important it is for an idol to project an image of innocence and purity. For an idol's fans, they represent an incorruptible force of good in their life, a stand-in for their child, sibling, friend, or even romantic focus that can never disappoint you and provides you a way to escape from the people in your life who let you down down or expect things from you. An idol never says no, an idol doesn't enter into a relationship with anyone, and an idol will always be there for you no matter what happens in your world. Such a persona requires constant upkeep, and for the aspiring idol their life becomes not what they want, but what their agents and fans want. Obviously all of these things they're made to endure, and the image they project to appease their benefactors and fans, is paramount to any idol's success. But before all of these things, comes the most important requirement to become an idol, natural beauty. Idols aren't just meant to embody purity and innocence, they're meant to appear pure and innocent. But wearing a dress that covers your ankles isn't exactly the type of outward humbleness these fans are looking for. If man and woman alike are going to look up to someone, they're much more inclined to do so if they're beautiful. Very few people want an average looking person to serve as the star that becomes the object of their affections, as everybody is surrounded by people like that. As average is, well, the average. When people look to an idol, they want someone out of this world, someone who's pure and innocent, yes, but also angelic and gorgeous. It might seem unfair, but that's the way the world works. And while there have been efforts to give average aesthetics the spotlight it deserves, it's that one in a million supermodel look that inevitably holds people's attention. And if you're an aspiring idol, overwhelming beauty is a necessity. Rumi Hidaka was once an aspiring idol, and she almost held within her grasp all the glory that she believed such a position would provide her. But in the eyes of the idol makers, Rumi wasn't good enough. She might have been able to dedicate her life to the rigorous demands of being an idol, like anyone else could, but she just wasn't pretty enough. Her eyes are beady and set too far apart. She's a bit overweight during the time that this story takes place, and it could be that she's always had issues with her weight, and it's very possible that there were faults in her personality or her talents that added to the flaws that kept the talent agents from truly taking her on as an idol. So Rumi was shooed away from the job she wanted more than anything in the world, and when you have a dream and you're told you aren't good enough to dream that dream, that components of your person that are out of your control are wrong, and that you'll never be good enough to be who you want to be, well that leaves quite the lasting impression on you. So Rumi did the next best thing. She worked with idols at an agency, staying close to everything she loved, and helping others achieve dreams that were unfortunately unobtainable for her. We don't know just how long Rumi was in this business before the events of this story occurred, nor do we know how many idols she may have worked with. But whatever the case may be, when she came into contact with Mima, she was awed by her persona to the point of obsession, as Mima was everything that Rumi ever wanted to be. She was beautiful, her features were perfect, she could sing like a goddess, and she was as pristine as a mountain lake glinting in the sunlight. For the entire time Rumi knew Mima, she was living vicariously through her, and when Mima was on stage, Rumi was right there with her. When Mima made the decision to expand her career via acting and modeling, everything changed for not just Rumi, but Mima as well. Now we have no way of knowing what Rumi Hidaka's childhood was like, but the disorder that we see her suffering from in this film, Disassociative Identity Disorder, is incredibly rare, and it's highly improbable that a person would develop this disorder without experiencing some sort of childhood trauma. However, improbable is the key word here, as according to the DSM-5, the definitive resource published by the American Psychiatric Association, it isn't impossible for someone to develop this disorder without experiencing childhood trauma, just very unlikely. Now with this in mind, it could mean that Rumi experienced some kind of trauma in her youth that led to her development of this disorder. Perhaps the reason she became an idol in the first place is because her parents pushed her to be one, and the expectations placed upon her as well as any abuse she received caused her to disassociate by entering into an alternate idol persona, one that was perfect, and met her parents' demands. Perhaps she was just abused without the expectations, and forming an alternate pop idol persona was her way of coping with the abuse she suffered. Whatever might be the case, to make make her sudden development of this disorder so late in life more plausible, I'm inclined to believe that she suffered at least some sort of abuse. However, the fact remains that no matter what the truth of Rumi's backstory is, she is suffering from this disorder. And without any background information, we can still make some inferences regarding how it manifested in her personality. As I said earlier, everything changed for Rumi when Mima decided to shake up her career. No longer was Mima the bastion of purity and innocence that she had been for so long. Now she was a struggling actress who was ready to take on anything to get 
get her feet wet in this new unfamiliar world. Before Mima made this decision, Rumi had already begun to impersonate Mima on the webpage Mima's Room, showing us that she had already been slipping in and out of this alternate persona even before Mima decided to switch up her career. This type of behavior is troubling enough, but had Mima remained an idol, Rumi's disorder might never have evolved past this point. But when Mima agreed to participate in a scene where she would be assaulted, something broke within Rumi. Because part of Rumi believes that she's Mima, for Rumi, it's as if she experienced this scene herself, and after this deeply traumatic experience, she could no longer simply play as Mima in her free time and impersonate her online. Now she needed to protect Mima from this person who was clearly impersonating the beloved idol adored by thousands, if not millions. In Rumi's mind, there was no way that the perfection that is Mima would ever stoop so low, and so the Mima part of her came to the conclusion that she was the real Mima, and this fake Mima only existed as an interloper that was attempting to tarnish the sanctity of her reputation. Now, as I've mentioned already, this transition into a different profession didn't just affect Rumi's mental health, but Mima's as well. Mima wasn't exactly excited about the prospect of entering into a more adult-themed entertainment role. She actually felt that she was obligated to in order to advance her career, and were shown both her hesitation and regret regarding these new ventures at various points in this film. Now, it's perfectly fine if you want to use your body in that way to make money or advance your career, but no one should ever feel like they have to. Unfortunately for Japanese pop idols, this is an avenue that many of them have taken after they've lost their appeal. It's not a guarantee that once an idol has outlived their worth in the eye of the public, that they'll involve themselves in sexually charged media to stay relevant. But it is common enough for it to be a problem, as there are many who likely do so because they feel like they have to, not because they want to. This is the case for Mima. She knows this isn't who she truly is, but she's facing a professional crisis. She's not actually happy with the direction her life has taken, and a part of her feels that she's betraying herself for money and fame. These feelings manifest themselves in delusions that are brought on by the negative reaction from her fans, and even more so by the imposter that's spreading disinformation about her online. Unfortunately for Mima, not only does this cause her emotional distress, but it's caused her to experience hallucinations of herself as she was before she stopped being an idol. If Mima had only ever had these reservations about her new career path, and was never exposed to Rumi's antics, it's likely that as miserable as they made her, these feelings would have never evolved into hallucinations. But it's the other Mima that infects Mima with her own delusions. Or more appropriately, it's Rumi infecting her. And in this way, both Rumi and Mima are experiencing a folia du, or a shared psychosis. Another phenomena that is quite rare, a folia du occurs when people share the same hallucinations or delusions. And though it's not fully understood exactly how this happens, it can be an intensely jarring experience for any involved parties, such as the case with Rumi and Mima, both of whom are experiencing delusions and hallucinations respectively. Rumi is experiencing the perfect Mima as if she were herself, which is where the psychosis originated, and Mima is experiencing this idealized version of herself as hallucinations that are related to the ongoing stress her new profession and this imposter version of herself are imposing upon her. So, as Rumi is experiencing an increasingly drastic break from reality as time goes on, Mima is experiencing the exact same thing in a similar, yet altogether different way. What only exasperates these symptoms within Mima is the increasing amount of violence that Rumi inflicts upon the people around her. And for Rumi, it's the continued disassociation from her true personality as she spends more and more time in her Mima persona and the horrid actions she takes to protect that persona. There is another who is also experiencing this folie à deux, Mr. Mimania, one of Mima's overzealous fans whose obsession with Mima causes him to believe that the person he's been speaking with in Mima's room is the true Mima. Rumi manages to use the power she holds as a false Mima to manipulate this man into carrying out her will, using his fragile state of mind and fixation on Mima to convince him to eliminate Mima for her, which is another example of just how caustic Rumi's disorder has become to the world around her. Now the thing about Rumi's belief that this false Mima is corrupting the real Mima's image is that Rumi doesn't believe that it's only this imposter Mima that is inflicting damage upon the true Mima through her actions, but that she's being coerced into doing so by the malefactors surrounding her. So, Rumi feels she needs to eliminate the people responsible for creating this imposter Mima before she deals with the prime suspect in her crusade, and that's where the real horror of this story begins. First she sends Mima a letter bomb that ends up hurting her manager, Mr. Tadakoro. Then she murders Takao Shibuya, the writer of the show that contained the assault scene Mima filmed. And sometime later, she murders Mr. Murano, who took pornographic photos of Mima, before she finishes off her killing spree by murdering Mr. Tadakoro and Mimania to tie up any loose ends. All of this would 
would be for naught, however, as the real problem, Mima herself, could only be fixed by her demise, and after Mimania had failed to take care of the problem for her, Rumi is forced to confront Mima herself. And it's here that we're given our first true confrontation with just how far gone Rumi actually is. We see that her apartment has been transformed into a direct mirror of Mima's, and she'd even prepared a new costume for the return of Mima to the pop idol stage. And I think it's safe to say that during this moment in her apartment, Rumi had all but vanished. So in this deluded state, Rumi does the only thing that makes sense in her mind. She resolves herself to finish off Mima once and for all, by her own hand, so the stain on her reputation can finally be washed away, and things can return back to her normal. Normal. In the ensuing chase, we're treated to a blur of imagery, which reflects the ongoing battle not just within Rumi's mind, but Mima's as well. The reality of the situation flashing by, as Rumi gives chase to the object of her torment. Fortunately for both Rumi and Mima, Mima eventually manages to win out in this struggle by removing the wig from Rumi's head, which was clearly an intensely traumatic moment for Rumi, as her mind was essentially shattered once she'd been forced back into her true self, which is evident by the way she clambers for her wig without paying much attention to her surroundings. These last few moments of this struggle reinforce just how much reality has been corrupted in the mind of Rumi Hidaka, a mind so far gone that she cannot see the danger she is to herself and those around her. And it's only through an act of compassion from Mima for this poor creature, that Rumi is saved from an oncoming truck that she'd fooled herself into believing was the roar of applause accompanied by the harsh glare of stage lighting. In the end, Rumi lives, but her life is one of unlife, and existence as a woman torn in two by her disorder, and the woman once known as Rumi Hidaka, is all but a memory that's been suffocated by the false Mima that she created. So with many lives destroyed, and Rumi relegated to a mental hospital, what can we learn from her story? Above all else, I believe what happens to Rumi Hidaka is a cautionary tale that's trying to warn us of the danger that escapism can pose to ourselves and the people around us. Rumi wanted to be more than she was, to escape the drab world she lived in and nestle amongst the stars. But she wasn't good enough, and the pain that comes with crushed dreams sent her hurtling towards her own destruction and the destruction of many others. When you're facing any of the myriad unpleasantries in your life, it's easy to hide yourself away from the world and find safety and comfort in images on a screen or a person on a stage. And that's okay. It's even okay if you choose to replace everything else in life with those things. And if you want to let your world become the world of fantasy and fiction, you can certainly do so. And while that might not be the healthiest course you could take in your life, at the end of the day, your life is your own own, and you can choose what you want to do with it. And for the majority of us, if we chose to pursue this path, things would be more or less fine. But for the precious few who are in desperate need of help in their lives, these distractions transform into reality, and they overcome all sense of who they are as a person. It could be the lack of affection from the opposite sex, or the abuse one suffers at the hands of the people closest to them, or even the expectations placed on all of us by society at large to make ourselves into something greater than we were yesterday that might drive us to disassociate from it all. Things that give us the drive to break away from a world of pain and hardship and flee into the arms of these falsities that provide us so much comfort. It's okay to want to hide from the pain you've experienced, those feelings of hurt that run through your body like a wave of frigid seawater whenever your mind centers on those experiences. And it's okay to put that pain off for a time, but when you refuse to face it and you choose to let it fester until it becomes an untreatable wound that's decaying beneath the bandage you've placed over it, you're only delaying the inevitable. And whether it be through a break in your sanity, or the influence of others, one day you'll be forced to face your fears, no matter how hard you try to run away from them. For Rumi Hidaka, reality was just too much. The stress of living an existence that felt so wrong was too much for her to bear. And after putting off her agony for so long, Rumi's mind chose to help her by hurting her, creating this perfected Mima as an extension of herself that she based off the idealized version of Mima that had been manufactured for public consumption a person who was no more real than the delusion that Rumi's mind had created. In the novel that this film is derived from, Yoshikazu Takeuchi gives us something to ponder when he's describing Roppongi, a district of Tokyo famous for its nightclubs. Cities have long been known as lonesome places. The more people get packed in together, the more individuals feel a paradoxical isolation. To distract themselves from loneliness, people seek each other out in bustling commercial districts like these. 
In that sense, perhaps the gaudy neon lights, the towering cabinet signs, the marquee bulbs flashing in sequence, perhaps they all acted as a kind of bait to entice such lonely souls, much as carnivorous plants lure in insects with their brightly colored leaves and flowers. This is what the idol system did to Rumi. It lured her in with the promise of fame and glory, only to snatch it away from her. And a materialistic society, so caught up on the dollars that you can provide, ended up turning a once innocent young girl into a murderous monster as she matured. What happened to Rumi was tragic and heartbreaking, but so were the things that she did once her mind was broken. But at the end of the day, her mind was broken, and unfortunately for everyone around her, the evil of Rumi Hidaka was something out of her control. A desire to feel safe in the confines of the world she loved that catapulted her into darkness. Thank you all for tuning in to this episode of Analyzing Evil, and I hope you've enjoyed. What are your thoughts on Rumi? Did I miss anything? Let me know down below, and leave a suggestion for a villain you'd like to see featured while you're at it. If you like this video, hit that thumbs up button, and make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. A big thank you to all of my subscribers, to my patrons, and to anyone who's decided to honor me with a super thank, and a most vile thank you to those whose names you're seeing on screen now. Join the channel's Discord server and subreddit to interact with myself and the community, and follow me on the social media platforms listed below to keep up with the channel. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll be seeing you soon.